This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Thanks for downloading Grilled by the Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, the editor of the Staff Canteen, and in this episode I met up with Tony Parkin from Michelin star Tony Parkin at the Tudor Room. We had a special guest in the form of a pigeon with no toes in the pub whilst doing this interview, so apologies for that interruption towards the end of it. The staff canteen budget is pretty small, so I took Tony to Weatherspoons at King's Cross to catch up. Yes, uh, we know how to treat your chef. And to find out how the first year with his name above the door has been. We also spoke about accolades and what a nightmare he was around the 2020 Michelin Guide being announced. Tony was also very honest about how he was when he was younger and taking drugs and how he came out the other side. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to Tony Parkin from Michelin starred Tony Parkin at the Tudor Room. Um, Hi, Tony. Hello, my love. (laughs) <laughs> so, to start with, let's talk about the Tudor Room. Let's talk about that. Um, why you wanted to take that role, why you thought that was right for you at the time, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. Right, so um, I'd obviously been at uh, the West House in Biddingham for three and a half years, um, and it just naturally came to a stage where I wanted to do something for myself, have my own platform, um, to which the job at the Tudor Room, Great Fosters, came up. Um, and within about a month we changed the name of the restaurant and rebranded it mainly because I wanted my own identity Did you always want your name above the door? Is that always the plan when you took that role on? Um, I think so uh, mainly because it gave uh, a little bit of person- my own personality in the restaurant which is what's been implemented now um, but just making it a little bit more personal I've never really wanted to own my own restaurant Um, but to be given the opportunity to run it um, completely from the front of house, the back of house, uh, the way the service is, I suppose, run. We lead the service from the kitchen. Um, Yeah, it's kind of, as time's gone on, it's been more apparent that that's what I wanted. So how long have you been there now? It'll be a year next month. And how has that year gone? Is it kind of has it been fast has it been what you expected there been high points low points um it's gone extremely extremely quickly it's been amazing um i'd say a dream come true because i think achieving the star in five months was you know it's incredible um i also think that uh just just the way it's progressed and how quickly it's progressed is quite scary uh the food's come on leaps and bounds from when i first started just the general running of the kitchen and, and the restaurant day to day it's just got better and better and better um, the restaurant's full pretty much a month in advance now um, and yeah I mean compared to this time last year it's, it's incredible so let's go back a little bit then to obviously the, the star um, did you feel because you took over from Douglas Baelish um, did you feel um, who had a star so did you feel a lot of pressure to obviously retain that as well as make your own name with, within the guide? Yeah, I think the, the main thing was, was um, you went into a restaurant which already had quite a lot of success. Um, I didn't really straight away put the pressure on myself more so for the star. I just wanted to get the food right, make sure that the boys were happy um, and the running of it day to day. Um, but then towards the time, I suppose, I started stressing out a little bit more. Actually, a lot more. You stressed out a lot, Tony, didn't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was mainly because I wanted... I'm only saying that because I know you. And I know that you wanted to know yeah. so bad when people had invites and the, all the rest of it. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's something that I knew I could achieve. Um, but I put a lot of pressure on myself mainly to succeed in general I think I do on a daily basis anyway Um, and I know what I'm cooking now is at a very high level Um, but it was also for the fact that I didn't want to be in that position where I lost it at at the Tudor Room and um, then just be a restaurant in a hotel because obviously at the time you've got Matt Warswick at the Latimer which was down the road Cowarth Park Scott Star uh, Sorrel down the road and the clock house so there's quite a lot of competition so I didn't want to be that restaurant in Surrey that kind of 
lost the star and then was just a standard restaurant in a hotel. You just didn't want to stick out, obviously. And so the guide to you then is quite important to, to the restaurant. You, you rely on that in, in part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because it attracts a lot of custom. Um, obviously, we're a destination restaurant and a lot of people come for occasions as well. I'd, I'd probably say like probably about 90% of the custom is occasions and birthdays and anniversaries. And, and um, it's, I think it's quite integral. I mean, uh, also for as far as the Michelin Guide goes, um, we attract a, a lot of foreigners. So obviously being only 15 minutes away from Heathrow, you do have a lot of people that come, have dinner, and then go into London the next day. So yeah, it's, I think, it, but also having the star in a restaurant, it's an attraction, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and obviously um, you can't cook for Michelin, but you obviously, you obviously had in mind what you felt you needed to do to retain that. Yeah, I think it was more, um, I've been cooking in star restaurants for pretty much my whole career, and I think um, really it was just cooking at a level that I've always cooked at. And um, but also having the complete freedom of what I wanted to put on the plate, I was confident in by buying the, the best ingredients. Um, I don't know a lot of chefs say that, but by a lot of treating them really, really simply, and just actually cooking what I wanted to put on a plate rather than being dictated to. What were you more proud of, getting your name above the door or getting the retaining the star? The star, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I lost my mind towards Michelin, the Michelin revelation um, and it was just a massive massive deal for me um, I've either worked for people that have had stars and kind of worked behind them or I've um, just got to that level for my whole career so to actually be on the stage and get it myself especially as a new identity as a restaurant because there was a lot of banjing about which I think it was especially afterwards it was kind of like oh uh, He's just retained a star there, but it wasn't. It's was a completely different restaurant, completely different food, and I think it was it was amazing to watch Michelin sort of recognise that, rather than being like, oh, he's just carried on doing what's been done there before, because it's not. It's a completely different operation. It's completely different food. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Um, within this industry, obviously, everybody knows everybody, so a lot of your friends have stars. Was it quite nice to be in that room, get up on stage and, and, and get that in front of, of your peers? Yeah, it was um, it was nerve wracking, um, and the, the weirdest thing was is that I was one of the, the like because it was I think it was twenty three this year, I was one of like the last ones, so I was like what what's happening here? Like I didn't really know, um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, and I was kind of like sat behind Tom Kerridge and all the boys from the Hand of Flowers, and um, I sat next to Gareth Ward, and it was just funny because when when I actually had to get up on the stage, it took me ages to get there. <laughs> um, it was quite a long walk to the really, stage. Really long walk. Um, and I can still remember being on stage and actually just hearing you laughing because I think you were at the front because I was, I was taking the piss out of my, uh, my missus because uh, so, so she, she wanted me to move out because she was literally just like walking around me for a week like I was like a crazed bear. But It's interesting you say that. We've just taken on a new blogger at the Staff Canteen and they've, um, uh, she's a chef's wife and uh, she basically her first kind of line is that you when you marry a chef you marry the whole hospitality industry is that something that you'd agree with the funny thing is is that we i actually showed her that interview last night <laughs> and she pissed herself because she said yeah it's completely right um yeah she's amazing support she always has been um i think mainly because she loves coming out when we go out to eat obviously it looks after very well i think one of her first meals we had was actually uh she went to Watley with me and we get looks after really well so, uh, interestingly, this year, just to finish off with Michelin, they have said that the public are going to be able to buy tickets to the um, launch of the guide. What do you think about that? Is it a good thing, a bad thing? Does it take away the kind of exclusive feel of the event? I don't think so. I think they probably looked at it at the fact that um, you get a lot of chefs that ask for plus ones. They thought we could coin in on it. That's what I'd do. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's obviously a big, big venue this year, and the fact that they've released it already. I mean, it's later again this year. Um, yeah, they don't normally announce the date this early, so um, I don't know. It's going to be a bit weird, isn't it? It's, I, it depends how much the tickets are. 
<laughs> Other than plus ones, do you think the public want to be at the Michelin Awards? I think I think it'll be mainly um, chefs that are like the brigades are coming along. Um, I mean, like for me last year, that all my all my guys were uh, sat at a pub down the road watching it on lo- uh, online, and I know that the guys from Watley were doing the same. They were like sat sat watching it in a hotel and I think it's just now you mean you can get your team down there as well to watch the day because I think as as a young chef especially as like as the, the years have gone on they started doing the revelations which are amazing because it's kind of got away from what it used to be as you've just seen in the book it's made I suppose getting a star even more prestigious because it's a big event yeah. whereas before it's just like you'd see it in the book the next day um, I think it's great I mean shows more scope and I think it it's also kind of trying to publicise that getting the star um, isn't as easy as probably a lot of people think um, and does put you in that sort of elite group it makes it a bit more maybe mainstream a bit more relatable if you can be a part of it yeah I think I think now it's probably just trying to get it out there a little bit more I mean yeah I mean I think it's great I mean at the end of the day if, as long as I'm there it should be lovely <laughs> Can't wait for you to start getting stressed again. <laughs> Your poor, poor missus. <laughs> um, so, mission aside, let's talk about um, the Tudor Room and the food. If people have never been before, what can they expect from you as a chef? The dishes, the atmosphere, what, what's the Tudor Room all about? So, it's essentially a tasting menu with choices. So I've done that deliberately because you do get a lot of guests that are um, stay over for a few days and they might dine once or, once or twice really. But also it's a kind of I've developed it as a menu so we can keep it concise so the consistency's there. Um, I don't run loads of menus so I literally have just one menu which is kind of like a tasting menu with choices and then I have a set tasting menu which is a little bit bigger. Um, but the food's very seasonal um, it's quite simple probably more so on the plate not the technique side of it but I don't spend like hours and hours manipulating stuff it is very very simple I get a good product I work out the balance of it so for a dish I'll work out if it's like um, if it's quite a heavy dish I'll line it up with some another ingredient I eat I've got a really a monkfish dish at the moment with like a morel bourguignon sort of thing going on and then I put a kaffir lime sauce with it just to kind of lighten it up so it's very classic based but it's light in places as well um, the restaurant's very small it, it is very fine dining I'm not gonna lie it's not I'm not gonna sit here. it's like it's, it's kind of a bit more relaxed now but it's very like formal as in like the room but I just think with the fact that the guys come out and serve the dishes that takes up take some of the formality away from it because I didn't ever always want that I didn't want it to be like a, a restaurant in I suppose a three star in Paris sort of vibe where it's like everyone's really stiff and it's it's very chilled out it's got to reflect you and your personality a little bit as well right yeah <laughs> no <laughs> good old um, it depends what day it is like um, what mood you're yeah, in exactly yeah um, which is all over the place um yeah, it's so I wanted it to still have a bit of not I wouldn't say formality, but I wanted a bit more precision. Um, but I also wanted you to come and eat and sort of chill out a bit because you are in there for like two and a half, three hours, and I just didn't want it to be how would you explain? Um, just like a formal dining room. I didn't want it to be too stiff, and, and I, I've actually had to get through it by removing some of that including members of staff um, <laughs> um, which I thought would bring in a bit too much making it too too formal but it's quite chilled out okay and um, have you enjoyed being it being Tony like not being under anybody else and, and have you found um, have you found it quite easy to find your feet and find your own kind of niche and this is this is me this is the chef I am this is the food that I make or is it a bit of a transition period when you've worked for people for such a long time is it hard to kind of step out from underneath them it's gone it's gone from just being in the kitchen and running a pass to um, 
making sure the boys are all right, um, running the front of the house, trying not to shout as much. Um, I've tried to like control, like I'm not mental as in a screaming shout, but I do, I do get grumpy quite quickly. I'll let things go and let things go and then I'll just blow up and I've kind of controlled that because I have to. Um, so I've become a bit more chilled out but I just the main the main thing that I've found the most difficult is going from being a chef to like almost like a chef patron so running everything and then dealing with all the issues like if there's any issues with customers of that I personally will contact them we talked about this before I started recording about TripAdvisor and things like that. So you personally do go back to people and you do want to, if there's a problem, you do want to deal with it. Yeah. Um, so if there's a complaint, which I can quite happily say I don't get a lot of, um, I will deal with them personally. Um, it's that what I was explaining to you earlier on. It's just that if, if someone's got an issue, I'd rather they said something at a table so I can rectify it and change their experience. But unfortunately, you don't always get that. You get people that don't say a word and then go off and complain on TripAdvisor. And although I'm not a massive fan, um, I do look into those quite seriously. And um, yeah, obviously you get the hump on about it. Like Especially when you get fake ones and whoever you are will find you. <laughs> <laughs> so has the food changed a lot since you started, do you think? If you look back to nearly a year ago, were there things on the menu that are nowhere near the menu now or have you just refined what you started with? If you, if you look back and think about it. I mean, we, we looked at me and my sous chef, Tim, um, we looked at it the other day, actually, and we were like looking through stuff and we were talking about... Um, it, it's, never been, it's never been shit, but um, the refinement of everything... And I think that's more because it's gone from when we first started. I was, un- I was unsure if the boys were going to stay, which they did, thank God. Um, and they've sort of understood what I wanted more. So they've learned a bit more about me and how I want things done and how we do everything as a team. And they want, we all share a common goal, which is great. And the food, if anything, is more refined now. Um, and it's getting better. Um, and that's that's the thing is, is that, like I was saying that over what nearly a year now just the, the precision and the difference in it is just getting spiraling out of control almost there's almost like too many ideas come in that we have to control ourselves sometimes because it's like we could I, otherwise it's like ends up being just so many ideas we're like oh we'll do this another time so we've actually started building up almost like a portfolio of dishes that we're ready to go on the menu because we can't put on 20, 30 dishes. Is it like literally what? Two, four, two, like 10, 10 dishes. So I've now got dishes ready to go on, in the late spring because they've already been tested and etc. So as soon as that product comes in, I can go, right, we can roll with that dish. So that's quite good. So now you've got the food where you want it to be. You've got the accolades, you've got the restaurant. What what's next for like for you in terms of goals and did you set did you set yourself goals when you were younger you know a lot of chefs say I want a restaurant by the time I'm 30 I want a star by the time I'm a certain age like I want to be earning this much by the time I'm whatever age did you ever have those kind of goals I think I think the thing was is that I I've worked in quite a lot of places and I just got to the stage that um in all honesty probably about a year ago I was looking at going back into the private sector um, because I was just a bit fed up and this goes back to what I was saying about my missus she was the one that kind of it was a, she was the one that said to me I don't think you should do it because she said you, you know what you want to do which and what your end goal is and I think going back into the private sector is just going to you'll go into it and you'll never come back out of it so she was great for that um, and then I also had a conversation with Mikel from the greenhouse and he, he kind of said the same thing so goal-wise, I've always been driven, but um, I've kind of needed someone just to kind of give me a bit of a slap around the head and go for it again. I'm sure there's plenty of people who've wanted to slap me around the head, Tony. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> mainly, mainly marketing people at the moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's... it's I'm going to say the goal, the goal happened in October. That's what I wanted, deep down. I'm not going to lie. 
Um, it was something that I've worked hard for, and it was nice that what Michelin said, and they said that I was undaunted by the fact to go into a property with a star, and it said that I was a chef that understood my craft. That was lovely, and it, and it kind of I've been cooking for 20 years now, and. Um, yeah, it just got to a stage that I think what I've achieved. I think sometimes I still don't believe it's real. Do you know what I mean? It's sometimes I think when you're working anyway, it's you kind of don't always think about like I don't know, like, swan around like oh I've got a star or anything like. It's not like that at all. But it's the, there's there's goals. I mean, like keeping the restaurant busy is definitely um, a massive goal. And I think the, the way I always look at the restaurant is although the restaurant existed as the Tudor Inn beforehand is that what we're doing now is completely new and that's what I've explained to I think the general manager at the hotel understands that. She was, she was a big part of changing it. Um, the owners are exactly the same. So essentially the, the restaurant now with me there is, is only like really 11 months old. And that's the thing is and what we've achieved in 11 months is massive. Like star, we've got the three rosettes the other day I suppose which was great <laughs> and so why the pause I, I don't know I just, I just think it's it's a bit of a I don't know I wasn't too happy about it I was and I wasn't um, I just think I think what we're doing is very 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 high level and uh, feedback we get is extremely good and I just yeah I wasn't I was happy but I wasn't so you're a bit disappointed. Yeah, I think I think for the amount of work that we're doing and um, what we, yeah, just the way it is, I was just kind of like a bit shocked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I was going to say now you've got you said the star was obviously your main goal and you've got that like what else do you want do you, would you want does rosettes are you bothered about rosettes or was that not the same as, as a star for you and without being too controversial and nothing against rosettes at all um, I think I think one of the things was is that when before we got the star um, I fundamentally didn't think I was going to get it I didn't think I had a big enough time frame to get it the rosettes had been suspended from Dougie. Dougie had four rosettes and um, they'd been suspended and I pretty much had an inkling that we weren't going to achieve the start. So I'd kind of not gone into a meltdown at that point, but I was. I said I addressed the boys and I said, listen, whatever happens, just we're still going to cook at a high standard. Like, you don't just like chill out because of it. Like, and I think I actually relaxed a little bit more in that period when I kind of dealt with the fact that I just need to get a job done sort of thing. I just needed to get the food better. I wanted to cook better. I was in a position where it's finally like, it's just about me. And that's probably why we achieved the star because I actually quite relaxed a little bit. And I was confident in what I'm putting on. Like, even now I'm massively confident in what I put on the plate. Um, but I never cooked for the accolades. I don't think I did. That's what every chef says. I'm trying to probably just jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> no, but I didn't, I didn't cook because I was like, I need to get, I, I never ever said to anyone like, oh, I'm pushing for a star because I think sometimes when you hear people say that, it's a bit cringeworthy. We weren't pushing for a star. We were just cooking at a level that I've always cooked at. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, it's a fine dining restaurant and we're cooking food that's essentially fine dining. Um, but then all the accolades have come, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, it has brought business. I mean, I think for me, what I was expecting is to get the star and the restaurant to be absolutely heaving every day. There's only 20 covers, so it's never going to be like mental, mental busy. But saying that, if you do 20 covers, that's 200 plates of food that goes out of a kitchen that's like a little submarine. So it is quite a lot of work. Like, I think some people still look at it as, oh, it's only 20 covers. Yeah, it is, but still, it's so 10 plates per customer so um, and then yeah when we got the star I, I don't know what I was expecting after I think I was expecting just like this massive entourage of like people just piling in and it didn't happen like that it happened two months afterwards that's when you were getting people that were travelling a long way to to eat and that was quite 
It was quite nice actually because you obviously, like I said, we we serve the customers, the sh- well mainly the chefs serve the dishes, and it was quite nice because you're talking to guests and they're like, oh, like congratulations, that's an amazing achievement, and you're like, wow. Whereas before, it took quite a long time to. I don't know what I was expecting. I think I was just expecting like coach loads of people to be turning up and bowing down to me, but it didn't happen. In one day. <laughs> um, See, so obviously you said you've been cooking for like 20 years now is there anything that you would um change about the the route that you've taken to get to where you are now and and if you look back what kind of advice would you give yourself 20 years ago that you think i wish i'd known that then um i yeah i probably wouldn't have gone out in the town so much (laughs) um I probably wouldn't have, I was quite cocky when I was like really, really young. I was a bit leery as well. Um, it's got me a bit of trouble, I suppose, in some of the kitchens I was in. Um, I, I suppose I was probably, part of me wishes I was a little bit more regimented back then, like, compared to what I am now. Um, I've got a, re- a really decent CV. Um, but sometimes I wonder how I lasted in those kitchens because of the way I was. Um, but what do you mean the way you were? What, what were you like? Give people an idea. I'd finish service and go out till about five in the morning and then go to work two hours later, like that. Uh, and now someone who's in charge of a team, if your team do things like that and it affects work, can you relate to that or do you think, for God's sake, why are you doing that? It dep- um, they, I don't think they, they wouldn't do it. Because they have more time off now, so if they do it, they do it in their own time, it's fine. Um, as long as the job's done, I don't mind. I mean, but you know, I can always tell if they're... I mean, my sous chef, Tim, he's got two kids. So I don't have to worry about him, he's fine. Um, and the other two, they're as good as gold, to be honest. So, But I'm, I've, I've never, like, practised... I've been a naughty boy in the past, and... Um, I would never like dictate to them and say, "Oh, you need to be like this," because I'd be a massive hypocrite. But I would never like have if they turned up six hours late for work and were all over the shop, and it was affecting what's going on. There, obviously, I'd have words with them, but they're actually re- all very well behaved. <laughs> it's annoying sometimes. <laughs> and we were talking off uh, off mic about the behaviour kind of in the industry and stuff. And without going into too much too much detail, is it is it? the industry that just kind of breeds that behavior or is it the, the it attracts people that are inclined to want to go out come into work maybe do too much of certain things um i don't think it's just our industry i mean the city boys used to do it all the time i think i think i think it's i mean i think just the if if we uh, chefs go out they normally go out on Mondays, Sunday nights on Mondays, which is a little bit weird, I suppose, for the norm. Like, and um, I don't think it is just Star I think it's actually it's just that we, we probably look at it as... I think chefs are a funny breed. I think, yeah, they probably go a little bit too far sometimes. Or very far. <laughs> um, but I think just... It's not just an archery. Every, everyone goes... I think there's loads of jobs. I mean... My missus tells me about stories about girls that come into her work and they're still half cut or had a bit of a rough night the night before. I just I think it's just that we probably because of the hours we work, um, probably zone in on it a little bit more. I don't know. We did a we did a, a drug survey uh, not that long ago, and one of the interesting things was that a lot of people didn't really know if they felt like they had a problem, they didn't really know who to talk to or where to go. There was a really high percentage. Do you find? What do you think about that? Do you think? Because a lot of people said they they weren't really sure what to do. Do you think you've got things in place that would help people if they needed it? And do you think people are aware of things like hospitality action and you know stuff like that? I think sometimes for someone that's been at, like heavy into drugs in the past, and I have, I've got no, I've got no reason to sit here and say oh I'll, I've done it once or twice. I used to really, really, really get on it. Um, the part for me is that I got myself into a position where I was in a massive rut and I've always been really honest about it like I, I didn't know what I was going to do 
and I threw my phone away. And I had all the numbers of the dealers or whatever. That's what I did, in all honesty. And I sort of like, for myself, I think it was a, a massive fact to my family, kicking me up the arse, sorting me out, having a chat with me. I didn't ask them to. They approached it because they saw the state I was getting into. And I sorted that out, personally. I just made some different choices. Um, I don't know if people are... I mean, I think sometimes some people have a rough time and you can help them. But... I've seen people, not in the past, I've also seen them quite recently, where you're just like, well, you're not helping yourself, sort of, to a certain extent. And I think they, they need to... I think you need to realise that you're, you're, in a prop, you're in a really bad state before you can start helping anyone. Yeah. So that's what I think. Anyway. And I suppose in an industry, like we've said, where everybody knows everybody's business, <laughs> it's not great to, for reputation-wise and things like that, is it? I mean, I don't know what advice you would give to people now having been through it and come out the other side of it. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. As you know, I love a drink, but I wouldn't do it at work. And um, I don't know. I, th- I just think it's, it's very easy to put the blame on a lot of things. But I think some, I mean, especially nowadays with, there's a lot of restaurants, including mine, which is um, the amount of time the guys have off is more than enough to chill out, get well rested. I don't know many restaurants that are still pushing their chefs to do 18, 18 hours a day, 17 hours a day. Um, and like my boys have three days off a week, which is a great thing, but also they almost like become so relaxed that the first day back, they're an absolute nightmare. And it, cause it's hard to get, I'm, I'm just as bad because I, I have like two days off a week and one half day. And my half day is like my paperwork day, and um, and like a prep day. And like a couple of weeks ago, I took an extra holiday day, so I had the Wednesday off because I had my daughter. And when I came in on Thursday, I was absolutely terrible. Obviously, I didn't let the boys know that I was terrible, but I was just like, "This is really hard work today." Because sometimes I think it's great they're having loads of time off, but sometimes I think they get so relaxed that when it is because they have to be there for 14 hours. It's a bit of a struggle to get them back on the go again, but they definitely need it. Like, I was going to say, how important is it to make sure that they get a, a good work-life balance? And is it something that's important to you? Obviously, like you said, you've got um, you've got girlfriend, you've got a daughter. Everyone else has their lives as well, and like, so is that quite important for you and your team? Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's so important. Um, I think, like I said, the, the days of being like, oh, I think. You used to, a few years ago, you used to have guys who were like, oh, I did like 90 hours a week. And that's great, but you're the one that's tired at the end of it. Like, the guys now in the kitchen are doing probably about 50 hours a week, 52 hours a week. And they get to go and eat out. They come into work at a reasonable hour. Like we start at nine every day. And yeah, they'll, they'll work throughout the whole day, but they only do that four days a week. And... Um, they probably still the only thing I, I probably do need to address is that they probably eat a little bit better because there are days I go like I, even myself I go like three days without eating and I'm like but I think generally the work life balance is so important because I think that's that going back to what I was saying before about you going out and doing things after work that, that's mainly because that's the only time you can really socialise with people I think other people in the trade whatever is now it's like I have I have like yeah two and a half days off a week or I have a night off or whatever when the restaurant's closed and it gives me the opportunity to take my missus out for dinner or spend a couple of days with my daughter or have my daughter down for the weekend or whatever and I, and I think it's massively important because if you're just in the kitchen all the time I think even from a creative point of view you get to a stage where you're just like just, just a block do you know what I mean it's just and you eat out quite a lot as well don't you is that quite important to you as a, as a chef or is it something that you just have always enjoyed doing anyway yeah I eat out a lot because A because I think it's great to see what other people are doing not copy but just see what other people are doing B I find it really interesting relaxing and C it's a great way of getting drunk without being judged <laughs> and we all want that <laughs> um, you mentioned that obviously it's tasting menus with choices um, is tasting menu is that how you like to eat when you go out 
No, not all the time. Um, I think I think it's it's a funny one because I've been to loads of restaurants where you get a taste menu, and it's the, then the chef gives you next a few dishes, and you actually come away and you're like, I'm busted. Like, and I'm just as guilty as that. I do it to do it to loads of people. Um, I do because at half time I just can't be bothered to choose. I'm a bit lazy like that. And um, if someone says to me, oh, we've cooked a menu for you, it's like, that's fine. Like, I don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm not a massive fan. Like, I'm not that big a guy, so 14 to 20 courses, I'll be busted. Like, I'll be really, and I'll be a world, world of pain the next day. But. It must come to a point where it's just not enjoyable anymore. Yeah. Um, I am. I, I like... I think six courses is perfect. <laughs> Don't tap out. <laughs> I think six courses is absolutely belting. That's like my perfect number. Anything after that, I start to like hurt a bit. Um, Note to all chefs: Tony doesn't need any more than six courses. Not ev- unless it's Gareth Wall because these are like mouth mouth size pieces, aren't they? He's starving. Um, yeah, I, the, the tasting menu I do, I do, so I do two sort of canapé snacks I do an amuse bouche and then I do I do like three big courses and then everything else is very small so they're like so I do like an amuse bouche a starter then it's like an intermediate course and then a main course and then a pre-dessert and then like a big dessert so you kind of are get it's nine courses but there's three that stand out there they're larger and I do that deliberately because you do get some people saying, can I just have four courses? Like, you might get a little old lady and she only wants four courses and you've got to kind of be a bit, like, adapt it. So that's why I do that. Okay. So you're quite, you can be flexible. Yeah, I, I cater for vegans, vegetarians, a lot. It's everything. Another topic that obviously gets talked about a lot is uh, obviously vegans and vegetarians and dietaries. But do, how, how, what's your thoughts on it? Are you just accommodating of it because everyone's different, or is there certain kind of things that you're like, oh, I really don't want to do that? Or I don't really care about it to be honest. It's um, it is a bit annoying when you you don't devise a menu and then it's like obviously you have dishes you have to change. But we, again, we've got like a bit of a back catalogue of dishes that we kind of we amalgamate for those people in need. And because we're in a hotel, we, I can't say I'm not going to cater for vegans, I'm not going to cater for res- pescatarians or whatever. If they're a pescatarian, that's music to my ears because most of my dishes are fish heavy. Um, and to be honest, what we've done is we've started working out ways where like a lot of our sauces are all fruit juices or fruit reductions or whatever. Um, and we use a little bit less dairy. I'm not going to turn around and go, oh, I don't have, use any dairy. We, we did adapt it. We tried a few things where we used soy milk, or st- and they don't work as well. But a lot of the dishes we've done have an element, like I was saying to you, with the balance of it. Some of, some of the dishes are like, the main elements are quite fatty and heavy, so therefore the sauce that's with it would be like really, really light, like, or like a, a mushroom stock or something like that. But to be honest, it doesn't really affect us anymore. I, I don't really... I don't really get too worked up about it because at the end of the day they're a paying customer. I mean, I know I know there's restaurants out there that are literally like no vegetarians, no pescatarians, and that's fantastic, and that's like I, I really respect that. But because we're in a hotel, I have to accommodate everyone. I can't be turning people away. Um, and it's like, for instance, two weeks ago we had a Playboy model in the restaurant who was a vegan, so of course. All the boys are um, bending over backwards for that. That's your record. So the moral is, if you're a Playboy bunny, you can be vegan and there's no issues. And get served by me. <laughs> so before we go down that route, <laughs> in terms of the restaurants and inter- restaurant and in terms of you, um, where do you see yourself going? Like, in, I know it's a difficult question, but like in five years' time, do you, uh, is there plenty to keep you kind of happy where you where you are and you've got a lot? in mind of what you want to do and then do you have because you said you never really wanted your own restaurant so now having done what you're doing would you want to own your own restaurant or is that still not something that you'd want to do no um 
I mean, I'm very lucky. Like, like I said, like the, own, the owners of the actual hotel have pretty much given me ownership of the restaurant. They, they obviously need to know from a money point of view if the restaurant's doing okay, which we luckily we're very busy and we're doing really, really well. Um, the covers are massively up on last year and um, at the same time, it's, I kind of like look after a lot of this stuff as an owner of a restaurant anyway and that's that was the that was the agreement it was kind of like right this is yours run with it which i think i'm doing all right <laughs> um it's like i said to you it's just dealing with the the other bits and bats like a lot a lot of the management especially like the gm and stuff like that, literally are just like take control and i think one of the things i did when i first went in there i didn't i didn't ask for anything so i didn't ask i didn't go in there so oh, i need this equipment i need that i need that and I think maybe that's probably helped me out a little bit because they haven't spent actually any extra money on equipment or plates because to be honest it was all there I mean the kitchen's tiny but it's really well equipped and um, it's just a pigeon strolling around the pub <laughs> with no toes no. <laughs> that's the weirdest pigeon <laughs> Sorry, for the purpose of this, a uh, pigeon has just walked past us with no toes. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't, to be honest, I can't really see myself going elsewhere at the moment. I'm really happy there. It's, I'm really close to where I live, like, all where, like, well, I'm not. It's about a 40-minute journey, but it's it suits my lifestyle. I think the boys are very happy. I mean, I th- like, it goes back to there's... I think if you're happy in what you're doing, it shows on the plate. And I think there's a, there's a massive case of that at the restaurant. There's the, we're never going to do any more covers than we're doing because you can't. There's literally no room. Um, we've got a few exciting things coming up project-wise. Um, not like other restaurants, but like just doing things in partnerships with people. Um, so we've got quite a lot going on. I said to myself, I didn't want to do too much. I've been asked by a few people to do guest nights and stuff like that. And I've really... It was a bit. It was a chat that I had with Mark Birchall a while back, and it's basically trying not to do too much and concentrate on the restaurant, and that's that's really what we've done. So I'll do a couple of bits and pieces this year, but nothing that really takes me out of the restaurant for too much because I had I did get to the stage when I've done it before where you end up doing it on your days off, and you just feel like you're not you're not getting the rest you need because your mind your mind's constantly thinking about other things and there has been a lot don't get me wrong i've had loads of stuff to look at like that's one thing like winning the star has brought is just loads of different opportunities and i've been quite strict on what i'm choosing to do so what about you as as in like your profile is that something that you would like to to work on would you like that to to be bigger and you know because obviously social media is so big and people like to be big on social media um tv stuff like that is that would you like to have like a bigger profile or is that not something that you've really thought about um i don't mind it i just i think the thing is is that one thing i've always said is that my because my name's on the door i don't really want to be out any i don't miss a service and i think that's really important because it's like i'm not a celebrity and i think it's a bit of an injustice if i'm not there Do you know i mean i think it's so i think i need to kind of well, I'm there all the time anyway. I don't want to overstretch myself too much. That's mainly for me being lazy. Well, within the industry, are there chefs that you look at that think, I really admire what they're doing and what, what they've achieved? And that would be something that I would like to get to. Like That would be like a benchmark for me that, you know, maybe they're not massive, as in on the telly or, or whatever, but do you have chefs that you look at and you think, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to be there? Um, no, because I think there's all kinds of chefs that all do different things and they all cook differently and I think that's really cool. I think I, I massively admire um, loads of people for different reasons. Um, I mean, I, lo- I look at someone like Miko at, Green- at the Greenhouse and I admire his creativity, but also how often he changes his dishes because I know how relentless he is. And it's just like, he'll like send me a photograph of a new dish. And you just, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, fucking hell, like, how does your mind constantly work like that? Like, I, I literally will come out of a dish and it'll take me a little bit of a while to think about it. And it's just like, he's like constant, it's relentless. It's like quite scary. And it's the same with um, a few other people. But it's, I don't, I don't, I think I'm at that point now. I don't really, 
I admire what other people are doing, but I don't really look at other people and go, oh, I really want to see what you're doing. I don't... I think I'm at that stage that I'm confident in what I'm doing, and I don't really... I don't really worry about too much what else, everyone else is doing. Do you know what I mean? I'd rather, I'd rather be, like, going out and having a beer with them and having a chat about what they like and they dislike, but, like, food. We don't really like food chat, like... And that's, that's one thing. Another thing of having that sort of chat with them and... I think we're all individual. We all do different things for different reasons. Do you know what I mean? And I don't really worry about. I don't really worry too much about a what people think of me or what what I'm going to do in the future. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I think I've achieved. I'm not. I've achieved what I want to achieve. But do I want to achieve more? Absolutely. But I'm not going to ban you on saying oh, I'm going to go for two stars. Would I like two stars? Absolutely. But I'm not going to get it overnight. Do you know what I mean? But it's like I said to you, I don't want to be one of those people that are like, oh, I'm pushing to do this, I'm pushing to do that. But at the same time, I'd like to retire from the industry being at the top of my game. Absolutely. Well, you seem very content with what you're doing at the minute. So we should just keep an eye out for that next accolade, that next star. <laughs> but thank you very much for chatting to me. I really appreciate it. Um, and like I said, hopefully I'll be talking to you and you'll have two stars. And you'll have something else to moan about. <laughs> thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.